before I start, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you once more. We thank you, God, for your presence. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your anointing and we thank you for the Holy Ghost. We thank you, God, that you are here with us and that you will never leave us and you'll never forsake us. Mighty God, as I take this segment in the service, I pray, my God, that your people will be blessed. I pray, my God, that I, that ears and hearts will be open to receive that which is being said, that which you've placed on my heart, oh God, to speak on to your people. Father God, I ask God to hide me behind the veil. Help me to decrease, that you will increase, and that you'll get all the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So diabetes education. Just a recap. Last week, we went over um, type 1 diabetes. We also went over type 2 diabetes and the pre-diabetic state. I just want to do a quick run through for some that may not have uh, heard it. Um, so in type 1 diabetes, what happens is that the stomach breaks the food into glucose molecules. The glucose then enters into your blood vessels. This important organ here, which is your pancreas that produces insulin. So the pancreas produces little or no insulin at this time and release into the bloodstream. Without insulin, glucose cannot get into your cells and that results in glucose being built up into your bloodstream. And type one typically gets um, diagnosed at a pretty early age. The type two diabetes, the stomach converts the food to glucose. The second phase, the, the glucose enters into the bloodstream. In the third phase, the pancreas produces insulin, but it is resistant to effective use. And on the fourth state, the glucose is, is unable to enter your body effectively, and then your glucose level increase. That usually gets diagnosed at an at a older age. The pre-diabetic state is when your blood sugar level is higher than normal, but not high enough yet to be diagnosed as a type two diabetic. So in this state is where you can actually manage your diet, manage your lifestyle to prevent yourself from going into a type two diabetic state. How is diabetes diagnosed? Diabetes is diagnosed and managed by checking your glucose level in a blood test. Now, this is what's called, these levels are on check, which is your A1C, fasting blood glucose, or you can say blood sugar, as well as the oral glucose tolerance test. In the oral glucose tolerance test, that means that you've been allowed to eat, and then your blood sugar is being checked, okay? So your normal levels are at the bottom here, for normal um, A1C, 5.7, your fasting blood sugar level, less than 99, which means that you have not eaten anything, and your oral glucose tolerance test, less than or equal to 139. When you're in the pre-diabetic state, you see the number starts to get higher. And that's when you have your, your A1C at 5.7, 6.4, you're fasting between 100 and 125, and your oral glucose tolerance is 140 to 199. In the diabetic state, your A1C now has gotten much higher. So you're now at greater than or equal to 6.5. At a fasting, which means you're not eating, your blood sugar becomes 126, and you have now eating something and you're being tested and you're greater than 200. Now there are three, now three types of oral glucose tolerance tests. For the adult, here is, is described, blood is drawn before drinking and two hours after. In the child, again, the same thing is done. And in, when you're pregnant, the blood is drawn before drinking and at one, two, and three hours after. And this is how we test the blood. So usually overnight, the person fasts for about eight hours. The blood glucose levels are drawn and in a high reading starts to show. The screening test. The primary screening test for type one diabetes is random blood sugar test. So a, a finger stick, which tells the physicians the amount of glucose circulating in a person's blood at a specific moment in time. A blood sugar level, as I stated before, of 200 and is measured in milligrams per deciliter suggests diabetes. The secondary, the secondary test is your A1C or your glycated hemoglobin test. 
The A1C is a blood test, as I, as I stated, for type 2 diabetes and the pre-diabetes. It's measures by your average blood glucose or blood sugar level over the past three months. So they measure you for a, quite some time and then um, determine whether or not you are in that diabetic state or not. This is what this is a good numbers to have, de fairly decent. When you start hitting here between nine and 10, we, don't, we really don't want you to start getting to that num to those numbers. How, how was the blood tested again? We do a little stick with a needle. If, if you're like me, when you see the needle coming, you start to cry. Yes, I'm a nurse and I don't like to be stuck. Um, and it requires just a blood sample and it's performed in a lab, the sample is taken through a needle from your vein. If the test is performed in a doctor's office or taken at home, we use a finger stick because you cannot draw your own blood work at home unless there's a visiting nurse that is sent there. Complications of diabetes. Now this is something that um, is very important for diabetics to know that there are complications once you become a diabetic. One of them, I'll go through a few of them. Peripheral neuropathy, which is weakness, numbness, and pain from nerve damage, usually in the hands and the feet. You have peripheral artery disease, which is a circulatory condition in which narrowed blood vessels reduce blood flow to the limbs. And then you have diabetic foot, where you have open sores on the foot that are slow to heal and are draining. Now, one of the things I wanna speak about is that there's a lot of times when a diabetic may get stuck. Um, some may even step on things like a glass and they don't realize that they have been cut. And so that wound stays there and it gets infected and that can lead sometimes them becoming septic. So it's important that when you're a diabetic that you're checking your feet, checking between your, your toes, checking all your limbs. You need to make sure that you're doing a good assessment of your body. Know what your body looks like. Look in the mirror and see where, you ha where you're having changes. If you're starting to having numbness, you want to make sure that the physician is aware of that as well. Then there's a state that is called a diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a life-threatening problem that affects people with diabetes. It occurs when the body starts breaking down fat at a rate that is much too fast. The liver pr processes the fat into a fuel called ketones, which causes the blood to become acidic. And a lot of times people go into keto, um, diabetic ketoacidosis and ends up in a ICU. Um, this has happened at times when people also are placed on um, insulin and they decide to skip their insulin, especially if it's a long acting insulin and they don't take it because they may say, okay, my blood sugar is 90, so I'm not going to take it. Well, the purpose of the long acting is for it to work over a long period of time. So you don't want to skip your medications unless you're directed by your physician, which will give you um, parameters of when you should and should not take things. Nutrition. So whether you're a type 1 or type 2 or pre-diabetic, making the right food choices is an important way to keep your blood sugar at a healthy level. When you control your blood sugar, you lower your chance of having serious health problems from diabetes, such as vision loss and heart problems. So you want to make sure that you're eating right. Counting your carbohydrates. Now, this is an area where a lot of diabetics struggle, is how do I count my carbs? Some people love to eat their bread. They love to eat their rice, their potatoes. And um, I've learned especially doing medical missions that, you know, I can't come to an area where they may not have certain food and tell them, okay, well, you can't eat what you have, but teach them how to eat and how to manage their diet based on what they have available to them. So let's say someone loves to eat yam and dumpling. Well, maybe today you like to eat three slices of yam and two dumplings. So tomorrow I may have to ask you to just cut it down to one and a half slice and one dumpling, but not completely take it away from that person, but gradually teach how you can um, properly manage your health while you eat what you have. Okay. So you multiply the number of servings by 15. For food that contains carbohydrates, one serving equals 15 grams of carbohydrates. So for example, if you have two cups of strawberries, you will have eaten two servings and 30 grams of carbs. So it's two 
times 15 is going to equal that 30. Um, so the following foods contain 15 grams of carbohydrates each. So like a slice of bread, that's 15 grams. A large bag, a, a half of a quarter of a large bagel, that's 15 grams. A half of a hamburger, that's 15 grams. So you learn how to calculate. It's important that you know how to read labels and see what is in the, the item that you're about to, to eat. And I'm going to be sharing this information with Minister Charles and she, and she can, um, can, um, can post it for, um, for the members to see as well. Now, a lot of us like to travel or go away or go and visit our loved ones. And so a lot of diabetics get um, anxious about that. And sometimes their family members get anxious that they're going to go away and they're going to end up eating the wrong things. But they can go away. They just, we just have to plan ahead, right? So there are things called free food. So, so free food is any food or drink that has less than five grams of carbs and less than 20 grams per serving. So your free food are like your non-starchy vegetables, such as your carrots, your broccoli, um, celery, lettuce, green beans, non-sugar drinks. Um, those are your free food. Okay. Um, unsweetened coffee, unsweetened tea, low-calorie salad dressings, um, sugar, sugar-free gelatins. You also have your carbs. Again, I just went through telling you like, like a slice of bread that is considered 15 grams. So just one slice, okay? Your drinks again, you wanna drink um, sugar-free drinks, unsweetened coffee, low-fat milk, um, regular non-diet fizzy drinks. You wanna um, be mindful of, of the calories in those. The other tip when, when you're eating out, especially when you go to restaurants, you don't want to take your insulin unless the food is at that table. Because if you take the insulin and your food does not arrive and there's a delay in that kitchen or there's a delay when, you, when you're home or you get distracted and did not get to eat something, then you risk your blood sugar dropping and for you to go into what's called a hypoglycemic state. Living with diabetes is never easy but it is doable. So the seven steps for better living with diabetes. Again, eating healthy, eat lots of vegetables and fruits, reduce or eliminate sugary foods and drinks, watch or reduce your carbs, watch portion controls, eat regular meals, lose weight if you are overweight, you wanna be active. So Sister Akele also spoke about um, the CEA um, workout sessions that we're getting ready to start. And if you need more information on that, you can also join us in our Zoom room. We can give you more details on that. So we encourage you to be very, very active. You want to monitor your blood sugar levels. Know what your A1C levels are. Check your eyes, your feet, your teeth. If you start to feel having blurry vision, you want your physician to know that. We don't want to say, okay, oh, it's, I'm just tired. You want to get that checked out. Take your medications. Do not share your medications. Know your pills, your insulin, understand how they work, and take the right doses at the right time. Problem solve. Recognize your high and low blood sugar. Understand what caused them and learn to treat and prevent them. So this is where that the, the diabetic person and their family members have to be keen in understanding what you are actually eating. Um, it's also important that when you eat your meals, especially if you're someone to take insulin, you want to make sure that before you go to bed as well, that you take that you have a snack because you want to have something in your system that is going to sustain you throughout the entire night and you don't wake up or not wake up because your blood sugar level dropped so low. Okay. Coping, it becomes difficult, but you can cope. You get support from your family, your friends, the church. Um, your endocrinologist should be able to refer you to support groups and different um, other patients that you can um, interact with and talk about lifestyle changes. And you want to set realistic goals and work toward them. Support groups that are available to, the diabet to um, diabetics are the NIH.gov.gov diabeteseducator.org, diabetes.org, and the jdrf.org groups. Okay. 
Again, any information that we provide to you is not to replace any information that your physician has discussed with you. Please make sure that you listen to your providers and take them seriously. Um, next week's topic is going to be on colon cancer. Um, as this is colon cancer month, we're going to be talking on colon cancer next week. Um, in addition, if anything that if I in, if in my summary I've not I've, I'm sorry, in my summary if I was not able to uh, cover anything that you were interested in knowing as it pertains to diabetes, I will encourage you to join us in the Zoom room where I'll be able to answer those questions for you. I hope you have been blessed thus far by the service. I know that you'll be blessed by the word. So please stick around with us and enjoy the rest of the service. And at this time, I will hand back over to our moderators. Thank you so much.